Welcome to Adult Bible Study with Bill. The scripture for our lesson today comes from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1-19. through 19. The books of Kings describe the history of Israel's kings from the end of David's rule until the time of the Babylonian exile, a period of approximately 450 years. We learn of Solomon's rule, why the kingdom of Israel divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. We see which kings and which kingdom follow gods and which ones did not. Sadly, most of the kings chose not to follow the word of God. In the two books of Kings, we learn about the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Of these two, Elijah is probably more familiar to you. But Elijah was no slouch either. After figuratively and literally receiving Elijah's mantle in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah performed a few miracles himself. He cured the sick. He raised the child from the dead. He even fed a multitude with a few loaves of bread. Now who else do we know did that kind of stuff? But I think Elijah saved what I consider to be his best miracle for last. And when I say last, I really mean last. That kind of last where he's dead and buried. Second Kings chapter 13 records that when the body of a dead man came into contact with Elijah's bones, the man came back to life, stood up, and walked out on his own two feet. Not too shabby, as miracles go, wouldn't you say? But enough of Elijah's resume. Let's see what miracle he performed in today's scripture as we listen to this audio recording from the Common English Bible. Naaman, a general for the king of Aram, was a great man and highly regarded by his master, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. This man was a mighty warrior, but he had a skin disease. Now Aramean raiding parties had gone out and captured a young girl from the land of Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master could come before the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his master what the young girl from the land of Israel had said. Then Aram's king said, Go ahead. I will send a letter to Israel's king. So Naaman left. He took along ten kikers of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. He brought the letter to Israel's king. It read, Along with this letter, I am sending you my servant Naaman, so you can cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he ripped his clothes. He said, What? Am I a god to hand out death and life? But this king writes me, asking me to cure someone of his skin disease. You must realize that he wants to start a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that Israel's king had ripped his clothes, he sent word to the king, Why did you rip your clothes? Let the man come to me. Then he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. Naaman arrived with his horses and chariots. He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent out a messenger who said, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and become clean. But Naaman went away in anger. He said, I thought for sure that he'd come out, stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the bad spot and cure the skin disease. Aren't the rivers in Damascus, the Abana, and the far par, better than all Israel's waters? Couldn't I wash in them and get clean? So he turned away and proceeded to leave in anger. Naaman's servants came up to him and spoke to him, Our father, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All he said to you was, Wash and become clean. So Naaman went down and bathed in the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God had said. His skin was restored like that of a young boy, and he became clean. He returned to the man of God with all his attendants. He came and stood before Elisha, saying, Now I know for certain that there is no God anywhere on earth except in Israel. Please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, I swear by the life of the Lord I serve that I won't accept anything. Naaman urged Elisha to accept something, but he still refused. Then Naaman said, If not, then let me, your servant, have two mule loads of earth. 
Your servant will never again offer entirely burned offerings or sacrifices to any other gods except the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master comes into Rimmon's temple to bow down there and is leaning on my arm, I must also bow down in Rimmon's temple. When I bow down in Rimmon's temple, may the Lord forgive your servant for doing that. Elisha said to him, Go in peace. Well, that's the scripture. Now, let me see if I got this straight. Two kingdoms, Aram, a.k.a. Syria, and Israel are skirmishing back and forth. And it appears that Syria is coming out on top more often. Syria's top military leader, Naaman, develops a severe skin condition and is told by a young Israelite woman captured by his forces that there's a man in Israel that will cure him in Israel. In Israel? Why Israel of all places? Could this actually be true? Or could it be some kind of trap? Naaman decides to talk this out with this king. The king sends Naaman with 125 pounds of silver, 250 pounds of gold, and 10 changes of clothes to a rival king with a letter saying, Here's my top military leader. Can you find someone who is willing to cure him? Is that the picture? Now, just for fun, let's look at this from the rival king's point of view. He thinks, here's the guy most responsible for all the defeats my soldiers have suffered, and now his fate is in my hands. Wait a minute. This is too good to be true. Am I on candid camera? Am I being punked? The Israelite king thinks this is some sort of elaborate scheme to start another fight. In the traditional Jewish display of strong emotion, he rips his clothes. Maybe this is the reason why Naaman was bringing those ten changes of clothes. Anyway, Elisha hears of his king's dilemma and sends word to have Naaman and his posse come to him. Reverend Robin C. Wilson, the author of our Bible study, tells us that Naaman approached Elisha with a grand procession of horses and chariots. He expected to receive great respect and much honor. After all, wasn't that the standard procedure with someone of great renown and high standing? Where were the TV cameras and reporters? He was Naaman, the man who had made a career out of kicking Israel's collective butt. Surely Elijah would cure Naaman quickly and with great flair. But contrary to Naaman's expectations, Elijah gave Naaman no personal attention. Instead, he sent word via an administrative assistant that Naaman should wash seven times in the Jordan River. Second King chapters 5.11 tells us that Naaman was furious. He railed and complained about this treatment. It appears that Naaman was just about ready to return home, bathing in that dirty creek they call the Jordan River. If bathing in a river is the cure, why can't it be a river worthy of the name, like the ones I have back home? Naaman's pride was wounded. He felt dissed. He was probably somewhat embarrassed in the presence of his entourage by the fact that Elijah had not seen fit to grant him any pomp and circumstance upon his visit. Yet, how much of ourselves can we see in Naaman? How much of ourselves can we find in his response? Naaman wanted a quick fix from this prophet Elisha and from God that this prophet served. Surely the prophet of Israel's God would have, could have just waved his hand over the bad spots on his skin and made them go away. Now that's pretty high expectations for someone who wasn't even a follower of God. Naaman wanted lavish ceremony and instant healing, but God rarely speaks to any of us in the specific ways we might wish. Not only that, he even speaks to those who don't believe the same as us. Cokesbury contributor, Rev. Brian Sigmund, has more to say on this in this video clip. Sometimes when we encounter people with faith beliefs different from our own, we think it is our job to fix them. Fix meaning to make them more like us. 
We may even mistakenly presume that our identity as Christian depends upon converting everyone to our way of thinking. I don't believe that's the goal of following Christ. Ultimately, we hope that by our words and actions, people come to understand and experience the love of God for themselves in such a way that they are drawn nearer to the divine. Oftentimes, when interacting with someone whose faith traditions are not like ours, it's best to let the grace of God speak for itself and move us however God is calling us to show up within the situation. A helpful biblical example of this kind of showing up is found in the story of Elisha and Naaman. When Elisha receives word from Israel's king that a general for the king of Aram desires to be healed by Elisha of his skin disease, Elisha does not seem to hesitate in his response. Let him come to me. No matter that Naaman was not from Israel, that he worshiped gods other than Yahweh, or that relations between Aram and Israel were less than ideal, Elisha knew he had been gifted by God with the ability to help the man and intended to do so regardless of how uncomfortable it made Israel's king. So, we see that after considerable prompting and coaxing by his servants, Naaman finally follows Elijah's instructions, and to his astonishment, it works. He's cured. He becomes totally convinced that Elijah and his God are the real deal. He's ready to follow God. He declares that he will only offer burnt offerings to God. When he goes back to Syria, he returns with two mule loads worth of earth from Israel so that he can construct a proper altar on top of it. However, he realizes he still has challenges to face. There is still a Syrian god named Ramon that he must know, bow down to when he accompanies his king to the temple. He asks Elijah if God will forgive him when he does that. Elijah knows that faith in God is not a phenomenon, that it happens all at once with absolute certainty not even for the people of Israel, not even for us. He probably also knows that Naaman will not soon forget the goodness and grace that God imparted to him. Elijah does not berate Naaman for his failure to measure up. Instead, Elijah takes the opportunity to let God's grace speak for itself by sending Naaman off with God's blessing. Reverend Wilson says the purpose of her lesson is to learn from Scripture ways to live in peace with people from other faith traditions. We see Elijah demonstrating this when dealing with Naaman, who worshipped a totally different god. But it is worth remembering that Elijah isn't the only one in today's scripture who met the challenge of guiding someone from a different tradition or background. Think of that nameless servant girl that was taken from her home in Israel and made to serve Naaman's wife. She had no reason to care for her captor's skin condition. He didn't follow God, so why tell him of a prophet that could cure his condition? And what about Naaman's unnamed servants? Why should they stick their neck out by trying to talk common sense into their master when he's in such a foul mood? If Naaman refuses to follow Elijah's simple instruction, why not just let it be and let him go back to Syria? The Bible names many great people who are will forever be remembered for how they followed the word of God. But remember that in the Bible, there are unnamed people who demonstrated their faith by following God with little or no fanfare. I will close this lesson by pointing out that God's responses to our requests rarely come with much fanfare. And unlike those TV commercials that promise instant and effortless gratification, God does not promise to meet our every expectation quickly and with little effort on our part. Instead, God often sends the most unlikely messengers to show us the way to healing and wholeness, to demonstrate God's power, and remind us of who God is. Perhaps God wants you to be an unlikely messenger for someone else's need. The scripture for next week comes from Exodus chapter 18, verse 1, and verses 13 through 27 as we consider how we can learn from people the backgrounds that differ from our own. In today's lesson, we saw that Elijah recognized when dealing with Naaman that faith in God is not a phenomenon that happens all at once with absolute certainty. And that's true for us today. Faith in God requires holiness. It requires faithfulness. It requires righteousness. 
It takes God taking our heart and forming it. Hmm, that sounds like the making of a great praise song. I'll have to think on that. In the meantime, stay safe and see you next week. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Faithfulness. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. Take my heart. Take my Take my will.